We're back for another exciting episode of The Spicy Life. I am your relationship expert and magnetic matchmaker, Spicy Mari. And on today's episode of The Spicy Life, I have a special guest in store for you. I have the amazing, the wonderful Dr. Corey Emanuel. And he is a media psychologist dedicated to shedding light on the intersection of mass media perceptions and learned behaviors. So give uh, Dr. Corey a round of applause. The crowd goes wild. <sighs> <laughs> okay, I can I go by Dr. Corey or do I have to say Dr. Emanuel? Which one is it? No, no, just call me Dr. Corey or okay. Corey. Either one is fine. Anyway. Okay, beautiful. Yeah. So um, I'm bringing you in on today's episode for how to recover from contempt and criticism in a relationship, um, partly because I saw some incredible posts that you had put um, and really loved what you were speaking to in regards to um, behavior and psychology around um, toxic relationships and some of the stuff that's portrayed in the media. And I'm like, okay, got to get you in for this convo. Um, it's going to be incredible. So I uh, really want to talk today about like toxic relationships and is there any ability or way to recover or heal while in it and staying in the relationship? Or do we always recommend going out? But before we get started in that juicy topic, um, you are going to share with me uh, our spice breaker, which is when did you first fall in love with yourself? That's the first question that I have for you. I would say around age 30. That was such a sweet spot moment in my life. I was moving to LA. I had sort of shedded all of the history and the, uh, the weight of my childhood uh, back in South Carolina and all of the expectations that I felt like were uh, attached to me. Yeah. Um, and so 30 was really that moment where I felt like I stepped into myself, stepped into self-love um, versus seeking so much outward, uh, you know, love from, you know, family, friends. And so, yeah, I would say age 30 was when it, it shifted for me big time. Beautiful. Yeah. I love that. Okay. So we yeah. had to start with getting you just a little vulnerable first to warm you up, but Absolutely. now we're going to deep dive into the main topic. Um, now that you've shared with us how you fell in love with yourself, now you're going to help others with love um, for their relationships. So um, just to give everybody a little backstory on uh, the spicy dish, February 5th, 2021, this great movie, Malcolm and Marie, come out. It airs on HBO. And the film stars David Washington, uh, as we know, who is Denzel Washington's son, and Zendaya. And these are the title characters, the, a writer-director and his girlfriend. Um, we wind up seeing the relationship is tested throughout the night uh, of his film premiere. And there's been some mixed reviews around this film. Uh, tomato meter, if I'm saying the right tom tomato meter, <laughs> gave it 60%, but then the audience review was 71%. And this is like a controversial film that I've been talking about with friends and then um, clients as well that are actually experiencing some of the tumultuous things and toxic things that we see in this relationship. But what I want to start with you is asking is like identifying factors like what is one, a toxic relationship? And then two, how do we know if we're in it? Absolutely. So I liken a toxic relationship to a slow death on the inside. Ooh. Um, it that is chills. where, yeah, yeah, it is where you are, your, your self-esteem is depleted, um, your growth is stunted, mm. and all of these things can be happening, and you may not even be aware of it, like you're so deep in the trenches of it sometimes that other people may observe it, right, and, and witness it before you come into the acceptance that I'm actually in a toxic relationship. Give me yeah. um, some of the, like, clear telltale signs how she behaves how he behaves how do we know if like we're the problem or if it's our partner yeah and I think you know that's one of the interesting things about toxic relationships is there really are no quote-unquote gender rules to it right you know I sometimes you can <laughs> yeah sometimes you know you can have the female be be more toxic than the male, you know, and, and vice versa. So I think first we have to just sort of take off the notion that, oh, only men can be toxic and that's where toxic masculinity mm -hmm. comes from. And we just, we, we sort of ignore that it takes two to tango. And I think we saw that illustrated back and forth for two yeah. hours in Malcolm and Marie, how 
really you can't say that one person was a a victim or abuser over mm -hmm. the other because they shared that responsibility oh my gosh so much yeah that it yeah. felt disturbing even watching the movie from a cinematic and artistic point of view it was beautiful definitely um, love both of these actors so sitting through it but then also feeling the pain and agony which I think like was partly on the director and writer they probably were going for that right they wanted us to feel uh, some of these emotions and triggers that maybe past relationships or current relationships are making us feel I know for me a lot came up from past relationships and I'm like whoo so glad I dodged that bullet. I remember the guy who did that to me. I remember the guy who did that to me. I remember when I did what she was doing to him. Like it was pulling up a lot while I'm sitting there watching it with my like husband in a currently healthy relationship, but it was still going through and reliving some of this pain. You mentioned earlier though, toxic masculinity, which I want you to touch on. Can you speak a little bit to that? Because we hear about, you know, um, feminine, masculine, but how do we know when we're witnessing to toxic masculinity? Yeah. So Toxic masculinity is really when a man feels threatened. Like he feels this sense of like, if I don't allow my maleness mm -hmm. to transcend everything else, then I'm, I'm in jeopardy. Like my, my, my being is at jeopardy, yeah. right? And so then they go on the attack. So that's what we see in our society, misogyny, homophobia, greed mm. dom violent domination yeah yeah it's that it's that reaction to feeling threatened yeah that's what talking it looks a lot like for those of uh, my audience and i've explained on several episodes what like masculine feminine energy looks like and oftentimes um lean into what uh wounded feminine and wounded masculine looks like it's wounded masculine what we're speaking about is someone sitting in their wounded masculine and um uh feeling this um heightened sense of uh anger or rejection from like maybe childhood traumas or previous relationships and of taking it out on you and sometimes it's demonstrated as aggression or um a jealousy or overprotection and so you saw a lot of that going on in the film and like so you know, i forced myself to like finish watching i was like okay i'm gonna finish watching this uh because i'm not a punk i can go through i can relive all of this but also too i want to be able to speak to people on it and i love the fact that you brought up um, some amazing concepts in a post that you had did. Um, give your social really quick so people, if people want to check out the, that post, they can go to it really quick. While sure, they're for sure. Yeah, go to Corey Emanuel, that's C O R E Y, Emanuel's E M A N U E L. But yeah, I think maybe two posts ago, I, I did a whole carousel devoted to Malcolm and Marie. And it was brilliant. So I decided to do a whole podcast on um, what Dr. Corey had um, written about, because I felt like it was so important in what we see. And, you know, we always say that we want this like deep, passionate love, but oftentimes like we don't want to sign up for some of this um, tumultuous um, hurt and agony that sometimes comes with the growing pains of it. And so if there is a way to heal, I would love for us to explore that on this episode um, or even how to recover or work through it. But um, first, I wanted to speak to your post about like, what do these things in your last post kind of look like in a relationship? So character assassination was um, one of, I think, like the arcs that you were showing throughout mm -hmm. the film that you had said was going on. How was character assassination showing up in Malcolm and Marie? And how does that look like, you know, in normal relationships as well? For sure. So sometimes character assass assassination is subtle. You know, it's sort of the little teasing, joking thing mm -hmm. that you might, you know, call somebody like, for example, you know, if if a guy said to his girlfriend, like, OK, pig, you know, because she <laughs> ate the last chicken wing. Uh -huh. um, a lot of people may feel like, oh, that's that's harmful. There's nothing wrong with that. But if that partner already has some internalized sort of weight issues, um, some body dysmorphia issues going yeah. on, things like that will stick to them. Um, like glue. And so I tell mm -hmm. people it's not so much, uh, you know, what you're saying sometimes, but yeah. all, it, you have to consider how your partner is wired yeah. and how they may internalize things. So with Malcolm and Marie, though, it wasn't really subtle. It was mm -hmm. like direct, very intentional character assassination. So it was much more in your face in the movie than yeah. sometimes it is in everyday relationships. In everyday relationships, because um, I mean, I tend to work with clients who are either single trying to find love or couples who are trying to um, work out some of the issues that they're going through and, you know, spark the flame back. 
one thing that I see often is um, name calling when it comes to character assassination, like hearing things from someone's past in relationships that maybe a previous ex had said, um, you're a narcissist. And now like having shared that the partner had said that about them in the past, with their current partner, now that's coming up in argument, like now I see why you were left. Now I see why they called you a narcissist. Now I see why they didn't want you. I know you're always gonna be alone. Like sometimes it, you're right, it's just as blatant like that mm -hmm. as it was in Malcolm and Marie. Um, but I love the example that you gave about like the subtle ones as well. Um, right. Both are just as hurtful. But yeah. once someone does the character assassination, what's your suggestion for communicating, hey, that hurt my feelings? Yeah what are we going to do you, about you, it? Like, how just, do we get over it? Right. You just said it. And I think too, it's on the responsibility, you know, of the person who's doing the char character assassinating to think about the impact of words, mm -hmm. how there, you know, there are probably things that were said to us when we were in elementary school that were mean and nasty yep. that we still remember to this day. And I think as we become older, that sort of sensitivity to that doesn't go away because now yeah. I'm, I'm older and now things should just roll off me. If anything, it might be more heightened now mm -hmm. because you've created this sense of trust and safety in this person you thought had your best interest at yeah. heart and now they're attacking you. So I think it's on responsibility of both people. One, the person who is tempted to do that to take a, take a pause and think about how is this going to impact this relationship long-term, but also the responsibility of the other person to identify that that hurt their feelings and, and why that hurt their feelings. And then give me an example, because I, I like to get real on here. Yeah. Um, and I oftentimes use myself, but I'm gonna throw you in the hot seat. Give me an example of a time you and your partner said something that was hurtful to the other and how you brought it up. How, you, how did you work through it when you hurt their feelings? Mm, gosh, you would stump me. Put today, you on the you? spot. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, you know, it's what I will say, just in being completely honest with you, is that one of the I struggle with confrontation mm. because I feel like I have a very sharp tongue and I'm all I am very cognizant of how I could say something yeah. that would be very cutting and probably not be able to redeem myself from it. Ooh, yeah. So I, I personally can't think of an instance where I've done that, where I've just completely Obliterated. just gutted <laughs> someone. Yeah, gutted someone. I think because of that too, I really haven't been in a lot of situation, situations where that's happened to me. Okay. Because I think I'm, I'm sort of, I try my best at least to set the example in that, yes. is that we're not gonna talk to each other that way. Um, but I don't know. What about you? Have you had? <laughs> <laughs> okay. See, I was trying to put you with the hot seat, Dr. Corey. Right. Um, <laughs> I love that you have worked it out and you've got it going on and you have operated, um, in this mindfulness, uh, state. Uh, I am guilty though of, um, so I'm guilty of having hurt my partner's feelings and then also been hurt. I'll give an example of when my feelings were hurt. Um, working out in the gym with my partner, we're extremely into fitness, but I struggle with like weight loss or just insecurity around having always been like the thickest girl in the room. So I think he said like something about my thighs were thicker than his and like <laughs> something about the thickness of my thighs. Like, and he was like, mine's all muscle. Yours is like got a lot of meat on it. And I was like, <gasps> Oh my God. Like I had to take a beat because I really wanted to start like going in and I'm like, okay, actually we're going to discuss this when we leave the gym. So I had to share with him early on in like our dating experience that it's something that's a trigger for me that I'm sensitive to. And while he may not have meant to hurt my feelings, him talking about my weight um, has always been something that like I stay in the gyms because of this like insecurity and knowing that it exists. The only way for me to have conquered it is by like taking control and the execution part of like a behavioral change and like, okay, well, if I don't like this about myself, this is how I improve it. But having to um, work through that with him and say like, well, it may not be insecurity for you. It is one for me. So can we just be mindful of like th this joke realm? Like when we get in this joke realm. Right. And so this That's is something beautiful. now that he's like, okay, let me not talk about my wife's weight. Um, <laughs> years later, we're like married. He's like, let me not go in on that. Cause I know that this is like a, a soft spot for her. Right. Right. And I think, you know, most anyone that's that's worked with couples is going to probably say like that's what's missing from so many relationships mm -hmm. is 
the two people coming to the table together and being honest about those types of things. Like yeah. we, we tend to operate from the wall. If I let them know that, then I'm going to be giving this piece of myself away. Yep. But now that your husband knows that about you, yep. he can show up differently. For yeah, you. exactly. Yep. And, and, and what oftentimes happens as a reaction is usually we do tend to, and I have in the past in previous relationships before I really like leaned into like mastery of self and the you know the relationship work that I've done but like I remember being younger and the moment that they would throw a dagger throwing a dagger back and that's not going to help heal the situation it only adds to like now two people being hurt versus one and us addressing it so um (laughs) for those of you who are just tuning in I'm gonna circle back and let you know we're talking about how to recover from like contempt and criticism in a relationship and I have Dr. Corey with me and he's going through some of the um, signs of, you know, what a toxic relationship looks like and how we get through that. The next one is um, identifying never taking ownership. So mm, I'm assuming that this part. point that you made is about taking accountability of the wrongs that were done. Yeah. Can you give a you little know, bit of how we identify that? For sure. So, you know, one of the big things in Malcolm and Marie was her not feeling acknowledged. Mm -hmm. Like she really, at the core of that movie, wanted to be seen. Yeah. She wanted to feel like her partner saw her as, you know, contributing to that relationship and specifically contributing to that script and the success of that script that he was being praised for. It was about her. (laughs) It was about, yeah, yeah. So, but he... But then also on the flip side of that, the movie was trying to get him to see that Mm -hmm. and see how detrimental him invalidating her in that process was. Um, And so for him at the very end to finally say, I love you, I'm sorry, thank you. Like those were his last lines in that movie. And that's, Mm -hmm. that's what she was trying to get at without you know, all of the, the back and forth that took place, right? It because so it just said much. it out the gate. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> it took so right. much to get him there. Why did it take so much to get him there? Why does it not, when we identify things like, hey, this is bothering me, this is a problem. When we do say these things, why sometimes does it take so long for partners like maybe Malcolm to come to this realization that they are in the wrong? Why does it take so long to yeah. get to the accountability part? I think a lot of it sometimes is just observed behaviors. You know, I think they point out in the movie that his um, mom was a therapist and his dad was a college professor. Mm-hmm. And I've been sort of thinking in my mind what what socialization and conditioning happened for him as a mm-hmm. result of two very probably successful, hard hardworking you know, always about their job and how that sort of set him up to show up, um, both in his relationships and professionally. Mm. So I do think that there, there's probably some learned behaviors there. Perhaps he experienced some neglect and rejection himself growing up as a result of his parents' um, profession. So there's a lot of possibilities there. Because it didn't really go so much into the story of why he's wounded. We just knew he was wounded. Exactly. Where Marie, we got a lot of insight into her trauma and the things that she experienced. Right. Not so exactly. much about Malcolm. They didn't really deep dive into why he is or embodies this um, toxic masculinity of a man. Or like he's in denial. Like it didn't really go into um, his character so much and how it was built. Where like right. with her, they went into a lot more depth. So we got to understand Absolutely. where she's coming from and where she's going. Yeah. Yeah. And I mean, we, we know we were able to see on a surface level that Malcolm does have a lot of insecurities. Mm -hmm. And so with that, you, you can sort of see why he responds and reacts the way he does when she pokes at certain areas of his life. Yeah. (laughs) She was throwing, she was getting her daggers in too. I was like, both of y'all are, they are lethal. Both of them are lethal. Um, the next point that you had brought up on your post that I absolutely love too was um, control without knowing it. Yeah, that's a huge See this one. one a lot. Please deep dive into this. Yeah, so this one, um, I remember actually going through this sort of supporting my mom um, mm. with this in a relationship she was in where she got ready to go out of town and she got to Miami actually for a work conference. And when she got there, her bathing suit that she packed was not in her suitcase. The guy she was seeing had taken it out of the suitcase. Oh, wow. (laughs) He had taken it out prior to her leaving and going. And so that's just, that's just one, like, and that is more in your face. Like, clearly you're trying to control me, not wearing a bathing suit, but it will often show up as, you know, 
telling you what to wear, mm-hmm. um, you know, sort of shutting down you doing things without them or asking a lot of questions about who you've been talking to and where you've been. Yeah. Yeah. It, it can kind of vary and weave in and out, but it's, it's very much the person trying to basically control who you are and, who do and you your think whereabouts. In this relationship of Malcolm and Marie, we're trying to control who? Mm. I mean, you could argue that Malcolm was trying to control Marie by not even giving her that part mm-hmm. because it would have allowed her to perhaps shine. Yeah. It would have allowed her to be the star in that moment versus him, the writer, yeah. the creator of the film. Mm-hmm. So I can see that because to her point, you know, why didn't you audition me? Like I'm an actress. Yeah. Like, this is what I do. So I think it could be argued that there was a part of him that felt a sense of, let me control this narrative. Let me control who sort of shines the brightest. And I think that that could be likened to probably a lot of relationships too, where maybe you don't mention your partner for opportunities Mm -hmm. that they would actually be really good for because then maybe they're, they're going to be seen in a better light than you did or is that jealousy like because I feel like that's your next point about (laughs) jealous passive aggressive behavior (laughs) absolutely and I I talked about this in another sort of like video real post I did about the connection between insecurities and jealousy Mm -hmm. too so it it absolutely makes sense for Malcolm to to be experiencing both of those well so here's the thing I did get into a debate with my husband about it because I felt like well Malcolm didn't audition her because he doesn't have maybe faith in her um, based on the things that she has like tapped out in or given up on or having witnessed like and having to pull her out some of the positions that she's put herself in based on her addictions. um, Maybe he doesn't see her as competent enough for the role Um, because she too was suffering from insecurities um, and a lot of low self-esteem. His argument was, so what? That's his partner. If anything, Mm -hmm. she shouldn't have even had to audition. The role should have just been given Mm -hmm. to her. And I felt like, (laughs) so I'm like over here defending Malcolm and I'm like, but you know, she's only shown maybe like irresponsibility. She, you know, he, this is something that he's been working on. And he's like, no, if, if you're with someone, you should have absolute faith in them. And Mm -hmm. if not, you shouldn't be with that person. If you don't respect them, if you don't admire them, if you don't think that they can rise to the occasion, like, what are you doing with this person? And so he was like, she should, it should have automatically gone to her. She shouldn't even had to. And I was like, okay, I can see that point of view. Um, in but my you, know, I think <laughs> you brought up something earlier that I think applies to this uh, moment too, is the, the communication that, that needs to take place because Absolutely. on one side of it, you could have it where Marie, when she was reading the drafts and, mm-hmm. you know, doing all of that, where she could have said, babe, I really, I, I really would like to audition for this role. You could that have works. had that. And you could have also had Malcolm be like, you know what, I'm gonna be honest with you. I would love for this part to go to you I see you doing this part but babe like your track record how do I know right you're gonna show you know what I'm saying but how can I trust you Mm -hmm. right it it really should have been a conversation between both of them earlier on you know about neither of them were speaking up and expressing their concerns or like fears um and even like the positive things as well right if I can't believe she waited so long to say that she should have that role. Like you let a whole film get written about you, a whole movie get directed and you waited till the night of the premiere to say that that should have been yours. See, that part is hard for me because I'm a firm believer of closed mouths don't get fed. And the expectation that things should just be handed to you. While I do think that when you're in partnership, um, you are entitled to certain benefits of that partnership. I also think that you have to guide and coach your partner on your needs. I don't think that we're all equipped just coming into this world knowing what each person needs. That's learned, nope. right? So the fact that she felt maybe entitled to that role, but he didn't feel like it should just be given to her. I think that even in situations like that, or I don't even care if it's like what you cook me for dinner, we need to have a discussion about what I like, what my needs are and how you can show up for me early on so that we can start this pattern and behavior versus the neglectful, ignorant one of you not knowing any better. Therefore, you're not going to do better. I'm not here for that. Right. And that recently, you know, there is a really good example. I know I didn't give you a good one from earlier, but there is a recent. (laughs) Oh, now you think of it. Now I I got an example. So uh, 
recently I was having a conversation with someone I'm dating about like I'm 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 writing and producing on my end mm. and he is singing performing on his end right and so we were talking about the possible synergy of of work in terms of you know what what show or film doesn't have just unforgettable music attached to it right mm. and, and sort of maybe thinking about that as as I'm writing and sharing scripts and like how like do you have a song for this like do you feel like like you have something that would fit this I think like your your point you're making is that we've got to have those conversations earlier on and sort of let's build a culture of this is what we do like, right. this is what we we talk about how the work we how the work we do complements each other yep. what are our goals how are how are they aligned with each yep. other and that eliminates some of that mystery well I, I didn't even know that you would be interested in, in us doing this together. Right. Like we've, we've taken that off the table because it's been an ongoing conversation. Yeah, this notion of just assumptions, like yeah. <laughs> yeah. that is going to make us literally feel like an ass when we make these assumptions. And I'm not going to say I'm guilty of it, but I have learned the hard way, like, oh, things are not just as blatant as we think. And to think that we are top priority, the forefront of our partner's mind, 24 seven, always thinking about how they can serve us. It gets away from us. Unrealistic. <laughs> like, I love the idea of that, right. but it's unrealistic. I'm sure Corey, you're running an empire like I am. My husband's run. like, how are we going to um, make sure that we're taking care of all of like the things that keep our business running? And then also, well, how does my partner feel about this? If we develop that culture, like you said, of checking in with each other and it, it starts to become natural for us like hmm let me see if my partner can do that so I love that suggestion my spicy tip for you guys is to actually do that like <laughs> check Absolutely. in with one another um you know have a, a moment when you are like how did I do this week in the relationship like or even just scheduling appointments for like how are we showing up for one another in the relationship how are we supporting one another right. um in addition another spicy tip is talk about what your relationship goals are with each other but then also what your relationship goals are for your business for your family um even separate like this is what i envision is that in alignment with you and what you got going on i think Absolutely. those check-ins with each other actually would be extremely helpful especially since we can sometimes time gets in the way or you know business or you know family friends there's like all these other distractions in the world that gets a little bit harder <laughs> so yeah. let's make it easy on each other with open communication right right Okay, next one. Um, so we mentioned we glazed over the jealous passive aggressive behavior. And I liked how you gave the example of your mom's um, swimsuit and that yeah. being like an obvious um, jealous passive aggressive behavior. But right. can, you get, can you dive more into what the passive aggressiveness and why that's harmful in friendships, why that's harmful in you know relationships with family, friends, lovers, all of the above coworkers? Because oftentimes I see this come up often and I'm always like gosh if we can just get people to express themselves more if we can just get yeah. you to feel comfortable and vulnerable enough to share about what's bothering you um can you dive a little bit more into what the passive aggressive looks like for sure and i think one of the things we have to address too is that jealousy gets such a bad rap and i think we have to normalize that it's normal to feel jealous mm. like it's just a it's just a normal human feeling that we all are going to experience on some level it just is part of it mm -hmm. um of course it can get treacherous and it can get dangerous <laughs> yeah. um, particularly in the context that we're talking about right now but it can be likened to sort of stonewalling when it gets passive aggressive where you know you're just sort of like all right well whatever or you know i, I just won't go to dinner then like you just there's something that needs to be addressed and yeah. talked about but instead of owning that and, and identifying what that thing is, you're just letting the day, the night, the week go by. And it's clear that something's off. Something yeah. is off with us. There's some tension here, but you won't engage me on it. And it's, um, it's this continuous emotion or um, this tension that's building up. And sometimes it leads to an explosion and sometimes it just never gets addressed. So I think that when we think someone's passive aggressive, it eventually ends in an explosion, kind of like Malcolm Emery, but sometimes it never ends in an explosion and you just stay passive aggressive forever Absolutely. and never bring it up. And it's boiling right. and boiling and boiling. And then the issue, a, a new issue arises. And now you take that opportunity for that issue to dump sometimes, oops, to dump uh all of these other things on the person and they're like whoa 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 I could have addressed that 
when it happened, now I've got to address like right. five things versus one to work on. Right. And I, you know, I've had an experience with um, someone that I know that they were dealing with passive aggressive behavior in their relationship and it ended up resulting in infidelity wow. because they, they were not having the conversation about the partner not working at the mm -hmm. time and you know, she feeling like she was carrying the weight. And so that just, she, it grew into resentment. Mm. And finally, you know, to act out, that is what she did. Thankfully, they were able to, you know, get counseling and therapy and restore the relationship. But yeah, I think that's another example of like your, the tension was there, you knew you were off, but you weren't having a hard conversation about what the root cause of, of that tension was about. And so it builds. Why yeah. aren't we having these conversations? So I, I know the why, of course. I'm asking you a lot of questions. I'm like, but tell us the why. Why are people avoiding these tough conversations? It's uncomfortable. You know, it's gonna it's gonna bring stuff up back to the original, like why did people feel some type of way about watching Malcolm and Marie? And you mm -hmm. even called it out yourself. Mm -hmm. You're like, this reminded me of some relationships I've been in. I think yeah. for some people, including me, it made me think about some of those really heated arguments and debates that my parents had before they got divorced mm. you know and so emotional abuse is it's a form of, of stress even if you're experiencing it vicariously and so I think that was what was coming up for a lot of people watching Malcolm and Marie yeah. like you are you're you're watching a train wreck like in slow motion basically <laughs> yeah you know it's a lot and so I think again to answer your original question this isn't easy work but like the saying goes, it's going to be worth it. Yep. If you can have those hard conversations, it's going to pay off. Yeah. And so the, we, we were witnessing a train wreck. <laughs> it yeah. felt yeah. like the entire time I've been watching a train wreck and I'm like, Ooh, I, I need a seat belt. Cause this at any moment is about to like crash. Right. Absolutely. Um, and it kept crashing and then I was waiting for it to get better. And then it wouldn't, it kept crashing. That happens yeah. oftentimes in relationship though. There's people who are currently in this situation of, crash hoping for better but it doesn't get better crashing 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 every other week they're arguing over something small every other week they are saying these cruel things we've already gone through character assassination never taking ownership control without knowing it and jealous passive aggressive behavior and those things keep going up on a weekly basis you brought up stress what is that doing to a person's health to their mental oh my state God. yeah i mean you you got to think about the anxiety of someone who uh, you know, knows that they're coming home to that type of energy every mm -hmm. day. Like you're literally driving home from work and you know what it's going to be like before you get there. Um, there are many people who are in marriages and they're dealing with depression, mm -hmm. you know, because again, they don't, they don't feel like they can have a conversation and they may not even have the tools, the resources, the words to even articulate what it is they're feeling. Yeah. And so you're setting up dynamics that are gonna that are gonna be stressors. It just is what it is. Whew, it's so heavy. Mm -hmm. I want people to get help. I'm like, please, um, if you guys are in these situations, <laughs> go to therapy, get counseling. Um, some of these things uh, will help alleviate some of the things that you feel uncomfortable saying directly to your partner. You can have a mediator help you with those um, tough conversations if that's not something that you are naturally born to do. Um, last point that you had brought up that I absolutely love was negativity for too long. How does that show up? What does that look like? Oh, this is, this is another one. I think we see some of this in Malcolm and Marie is that, like we said, she was reading drafts of the script for mm -hmm. however long it took him. Uh, I think he even mentioned when they first started dating, he already had a draft of it done. So allegedly. Allegedly, I'm like, I don't right? Know if I believe that. I, all right. <laughs> so you know, for for Marie, I don't. When she came in the door at the top of that movie, upset about him not thanking her, I think that 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 was building up. Mm -hmm. That wasn't just oh, tonight I'm going to be pissed off because you didn't thank me. She yeah. already had some feelings, and so going back to this thing we keep talking about, you probably knew six months, a year ago. Mm -hmm that you were hurt, that you were disappointed, that Malcolm didn't audition you, didn't give you a chance to go out for the role. And so that negativity has festered and now you've got this explosion that's yeah. happening. You know, and I think it's it's easy to do in a relationship because I think we oftentimes want the person to just get it. Like, why don't you just see and feel right. that I'm perturbed or that I'm annoyed <laughs> or that I'm hurt by this? And 
it doesn't work that way. Right. It just doesn't. You you know, you get to a rhythm with people mm-hmm. where you know, you're like, babe, I, I, something's off. Let's talk about it. But not every guy or girl feels comfortable even saying that. Right. And so you may have to be the one to take initiative. Another but, thing that I notice with negativity is that when you don't address it with your partner, um, it's, a, it's not just addressing it with your partner. I want to be clear too for the audience. It's also how you address it, right? When you're in relationship with someone, and, and let's speak a little bit to communication, there's a um, enough time spent, hopefully, if you um, have been in this relationship for a while, such as Malcolm and Marie, where you have learned the best form of communication, how they receive information, how they don't, what the best time of day is to deliver that, um, who, what, when, where, and why, right? So like you've, you've known these elements because you observe their behavior and hopefully you've researched your partner. Um, there's a way that you can say it that feels true to your authentic self, or there's a way that is true to their authentic self. I want you guys to be mindful of how your partner receives information when delivering the things that they need to hear and the things that you need in the relationship. And so they were clearly not delivering the information in a way that that partner needed to hear. And when it did come time to deliver it, they were doing it in such a hurtful way that automatically makes the partner um, defensive and shut down. But one thing that I often see is that we're not sharing it with our partner, but we are sharing with like friends, family, we're taking it out sometimes showing up with coworkers complaining about like our days, like that's toxic as well, because you are sharing it with the wrong people and not directly with the person who needs to hear it. And unless your friends are equipped to be able to give you proper healthy guidance in that situation, I don't recommend telling your your associates or friends or outside people or even like parents the problem without discussing that with your partner would you agree or disagree with that absolutely and I think you said it you hit the nail on the head it was less about what Malcolm and Marie were fighting about in this movie Mm -hmm. and all about how they were fighting yep and you just everything you just said it was it was the way in which they handled each other Mm -hmm. or mishandled one another that that made it be such a train wreck. I mean, just imagine like in your point about negativity, how they're showing up for each other every single day. Like they aren't even being able to like live their best lives or operate in love when they're operating from disdain, your word contempt, and right. you know, this somewhat hatred that's going on behind the scenes that's creating this built up frustration and resentment over and over. Imagine right. how every day she's probably making his breakfast. Cause we saw how she was making the macaroni. Imagine <laughs> how she's making breakfast and lunch and dinner for him. Imagine how they're making love. Imagine how right. they are, you know, spending time with family or even like how they're operating in work. When you're not at your highest self or highest vibration because your partner's energy does spill over to you. I mean, that becomes the word you used earlier, stress. And we all know that stress has so many additional side effects that are unhealthy and toxic just to your heart, to your blood pressure, um, to your cholesterol, everything. Stress is like one of the number one killers. Absolutely. And I think one of the things too that we have to be very careful about is there were moments in Malcolm and Marie where they were being intimate. Mm -hmm. And I think we have to be very careful about using sex to soothe in instances Mm like contempt Say that because one again. <laughs> yeah because you know you are it's almost like you're just muffling you know like you're mm-hmm. just putting you, you you're, you're suppressing for that moment but you could see that even when they would be in, intimate the lovingness around that was fleeting it couldn't even remain there was no room in that house for love because the contempt and the criticism was so big mm. and so I think we have to be very careful it's not saying don't bring love and, and, you know, tender love and care yeah. and, and sex and all that into the relationship, but you can't use it as band-aids without Absolutely. dealing with the main root issues. What would you say to the couples though who are watching this and seeing the makeup break up the arguing, healing, arguing, healing, even though they weren't doing really healing, it was more just like, like you said, a band-aid, just kind of sugarcoating um, yeah. in those intimate moments and then going back to the anger for couples who are experiencing that off and on switch continuously, there's more off switches, right? Like we saw actually more disdain for one another than we did love. Yeah. But oftentimes what we tell ourselves is like, dang, but I just wanted to go back how it was that one month, or I just wanted to go mm-hmm. back to like these- the nostalgia of it. Yeah, these, these loving moments. Like we have so many loving moments. Well, girl, you got like a hundred more unloving moments though. 
sometimes right. they want to weigh those five moments of love and let that outweigh the hundred moments of, you know, disdain. What would you say for people who are going through that? Well, <clears throat> I tell people, and this, this is across the board, like, research research shows that like emotional avoidance is is never it never works mm -hmm. just on in any shape or form you avoiding that you're really hurt right now you avoiding that you feel like your character's been assassinated mm -hmm. you know you've got to own that you've got to own that and it doesn't mean that you won't get back to the loving and you know all the lovey dubbiness of it but if you don't address it yeah it's probably going to show up again and you're going to be right back in the cycle. Yep. You know what I'm saying? So I think we all have to check in with ourselves and be like, okay, am I like emotionally avoiding what I feel right now? You know, or am I truly, have I gotten over it? And, and now I can sort of go back into this space of holding space for one another. I think we have to have those check-ins with ourselves. There's going to be people, though, who are going to hit me up and say, but Spicy, ask him this question. You didn't ask it. So I'm going to make sure that I ask you this. Yeah. There are a lot of people in situations, though, that when they do come to their partner, their partner immediately goes on the defense, attacks them, calls them sensitive. Women do this to men and men do this to women. We're not going to say one does it to the other. Women gaslight just as much as men gaslight. Both are guilty. Perfect. Don't want to take accountability. Absolutely. So when you are dealing with the partner who is gaslighting you and making you feel like you're the one who's crazy or you're the one who's so sensitive, right? Then you, that courage that you built up or that willingness to communicate and share how you feel now gets met with like rejection. What then? What then do you do? I think <laughs> this is going to be hard for some people to probably receive but I think if you're in a situation like that where you are gen genuinely revealing how this relationship is affecting you particularly negatively mm -hmm. right and you have a partner who isn't receptive to that like they don't acknowledge your hurt and your pain you got to ask yourself why am I in this relationship yeah and I know like that's hard because for some people that could mean the end of it. And, and like, no I've actually a couple, yeah, I've had two friends actually during the pandemic who were engaged and called off their engagement. Oh, wow. Um, because they were finally in space with each other yeah. to unpack some things that I think had been sort of building from, from, from previous um, times. But yeah, um, I think you got to ask yourself, how sustainable is this? Like, mm -hmm. if I can't come to my partner and share in truth where I'm at or how something impacted me, how are we going to make this like a lifetime thing? Yeah. If you got to ask yourself that. And it could mean that you and your partner aren't aligned. See, that's the part that nobody wants to hear, though. That's the part is that, that nobody like, wants to hear. There's not hope, or you guys should not be together. For those who want to still like make it work, and right. they are going in and relate through a relationship where there's character assassination, never taking ownership, control without knowing it, jealous, passive aggressive behavior and negativity for too long. They're experiencing all five of these things, right. but they want to make it work anyways. Is there hope right. for them? And if so, what the hell Absolutely. should they be doing? Absolutely. So there are antidotes, you know, so the Gottman Institute, they have done like over 30 years of research around this very area that we're talking about. And they've been able to look at things that can predict mm -hmm. the success or failure of a relationship mm. or marriage. And so, for example, with defensiveness, the antidote for that is taking ownership. Mm -hmm. It just that's research based. I'm not making this stuff up. <laughs> Makes sense. <laughs> when, right? when, yeah, when there's defensiveness, you've got to take ownership. Uh, when it's criticism, you've got to take away the you and the pointing fingers, and you've got to make that an I thing, right? You've got to turn that I. With the contempt, that is um, John Gottman from the Gottman Institute. He often talks about how contempt is the one area that can predict divorce if you've got mm. contempt which is what we saw in Malcolm and Marie oh, yeah. you can only imagine where that relationship is gonna go Ooh. like unless of course you do get in therapy and you do sit down with someone that can guide you guys through that yeah you are you're setting yourself up for failure with contempt if you don't get in with a counselor or a therapy like ASAP because there's there's some deep trauma and wounds there that the two of you together probably aren't going to be able to pull yourselves out of. Yeah. 
and, and not not just one person can pull the other one out yeah so it's got to be something that you come together on and in situations like Malcolm and Marie they're just boyfriend and girlfriend they weren't even engaged they weren't married so in situations like that where you're just dating or living together for their situation um it looked like do you recommend even while your boyfriend and girlfriend getting this help before you decide to get engaged and married I think you have to ask yourself, what is the intention of this relationship? Great question. If if y'all are just kicking it, then save your money. <laughs> don't, <laughs> don't, don't, don't even invest that. But if, if your intention is, you know what? I do want to build a life with this person. You're only investing in your future by, yes, while you're dating, mm-hmm. we're not even engaged yet, but our intention is to build a life together. So what are we going to do to set up ourselves for success in that? And so absolutely okay. get with the camp. There are counselors, therapists that will absolutely probably would like revel in the fact that two people that were dating were coming. I get excited together. when couples come to me and they're like, we're absolutely. considering marriage. We don't really know, but we have these problems. And I'm like, yes, happy that you came before you have to go to the marriage. Bar. Absolutely. Like, I love the, the pre- right. doing the preliminary work, right? Right. So- because the truth is what I think is the advantage of doing that when you're dating versus you're married is you may discover that you guys aren't aligned and that you shouldn't be together. Mm -hmm. So to me, I know that can be scary for some people, especially like if you're in love with them and you've started imagining a life with them. Yeah. That's the hardest. But if, but yeah, but if you're in that space where like, Hey, we can kind of see what we're going to set ourselves up and potential children up, you know, what environment are we going to be building for them? And, oh, there's some major like breakdowns and disconnects between us that like, this would be a disaster if we got married. But a lot of people will argue if you, if you tell your friends, like, so me and my boyfriend are going to go to couples therapy or get counseling or relationship coaching. A lot of friends and family will argue, well, if you already need that right now, you guys shouldn't be together. What do you have to say to those naysayers about getting help (laughs) prior to marriage? Yeah, I mean, obviously every person's experience is going to be different. You know, I think our parents perhaps were of that era that this would be so foreign to them. Yeah. Perhaps they're now thriving and successful (laughs) in their relationships, but we're in a new day and age, you know, we're in an age of social media where, where we're comparing our partners you know, maybe not even consciously at times yeah. to people that we're seeing on. The, there's a lot of different factors that have reshaped and sort of redefined how we have to approach relationships now mm-hmm. that I think generations before us didn't have to. And so I think every person is sort of each his own when it comes to what you need. And I think we have to treat it just like we should be treating our mental health. You know, there is no one size fits all like what, what I need and what spicy need can, can look completely different. And so we can't judge people's way of being. Absolutely. I love everything that you're sharing on point. Now you're going to let us know to like wrap up Malcolm and Marie. Now you're going to let us know, should that couple stay together? Yes and no. Cause at the end, right. Spoiler alert. If you guys haven't seen this, um, I want you guys to try to get through it. Uh, we wind up hoping that he wakes up and that Malcolm wakes up in the morning and Marie is gone. That, that was my hope. I was hoping that she came to the realization that they did not know how to love each other the way that each other needed to be loved um, and that she was gone. I know other people who are rooting for her to have been there and to prove how deep their love is and that you got to go through all of this pain to get to the light. What is your take on it? Should they have stayed together or broken up? You know, in reality, you know, they came home late from a red carpet, whatever thing. So chances are nobody's going to go home that night. You know, I kind (laughs) of felt a sense of that. But I I don't think that their relationship as it currently stands is sustainable. Yeah, no, unless they go to a therapist like immediately. Mm -hmm. And even then, to my point before, Malcolm and Marie may discover, whoa, we are not supposed to be together. And that may be really hard for them, especially depending on how long they've been together, how much of a life they've built together. But again, going back to the research on contempt, if you don't immediately begin to rectify that situation, Mm -hmm. is you're headed for a a major meltdown. When 
you have contempt and resentment for your partner and say Malcolm and Marie or other couples who experience what they're experiencing break up. They decide, you know what? Strong enough to leave you. I'm going to go our separate way. We don't belong with each other. Kudos for coming to that realization. They decide that they're going to split. What then do they take into the next relationship if they don't take a beat and do the self-work? Can you talk a little mm, bit about yeah. what the next partner is going to have to endure? Absolutely. That's huge. I mean, I think that is one of the risk factors with Malcolm and Marie. I get the sense that they both probably would very quickly jump back into another relationship mm. if they didn't do some individual therapy work. I just think that what we saw, mm -hmm. again, the contempt was just so in your face on both of them. Like yeah. that is a that is a, a pattern of behavior um, at this point that if they don't work on it individually, that it will absolutely. And I think you brought it up earlier mm -hmm. where you start to, yeah, I know why your ex used to call you a narcissist. It that's how <laughs> it shows up because you're gonna you're gonna get to a point where you're gonna be comfortable telling them things about why the, the old relationship didn't work. Yep. And the way Malcolm and Marie show up, they would probably use those things in in future relationships. So it just becomes a cycle, like a reoccurring. Absolutely. They don't do the healing work. They're gonna just hop into the next relationship and. Malcolm's going to be talking about Marie and sharing all the toxic things that they experienced and do the same thing to the next girl for the next film, not thank her. <laughs> Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. It's, it's just going to be a, a reoccurring behavior pattern in, in their relationships. Yeah. So you guys, please do the, the self-work. Even if you're currently in the relationship, start doing the work yourself. Um, your partner will also see that, that your partner will see you doing some of that self-work and that's another method to get them involved when they see that you're helping yourself you're no longer a hypocrite and just pointing the finger like you need help when you start doing it for yourself it now encourages and motivates them more to make it a team collaborative effort versus you just telling them what they need to do and what they need to change Absolutely. so to dr Corey's point about accountability it shows that's a behavioral change that you can do showing accountability like i put myself in this workshop i got this therapist or this coach like allow yourself to um you know demonstrate the things that you're asking your partner to even do and see if some of that behavior can then be mirrored right once they Absolutely. see that you're doing it for yourself um because i definitely i hate breakups i hate them sometimes they're necessary but if you can and we're willing to do the work, right? Because it takes two people. You can't just want to change. Like you have to be willing to change. And so you'll prove that through behavioral changes, which um, is one of your expertises. Mm -hmm. So I love everything that you, you know, share today about what, you know, each, what Malcolm Memory can do differently and what, about what everybody else can do differently right. um, if in these situations that are toxic. Uh, I'm going to wrap up with the naked truth. So I didn't warn you about this one either. This is okay. where you get um, a little personal with us because I love intimacy. So okay. you're going to let us know, Dr. Corey, what would your superpower be? You could have any superpower in the world. What would it be? My superpower would be to just instantly give every person a deep sense of self-love and self-acceptance. Mm. Yeah. Love that you just be like bippity boppity boop and everybody would have yeah. it. Yeah. <laughs> I, I feel like so much of what we've talked about today, you know, when we think about Malcolm and Marie, there's absolutely layers yeah. to them not loving themselves on, mm. a, on an individual level. There's issues around self-worth. Mm -hmm. there's issues around self-compassion mm -hmm. um and i believe that they they can't give each other what they haven't given themselves yep oh they can Ooh, i love they this superpower i want you to have it too <laughs> yeah that'd be a great yeah. superpower because we are i feel like you do have a, some of that superpower but it's like only people who come to you right only people because you do um do you have a actual practice that you lead no, I, I'm working on doing some one-on-one -on -one coaching okay. packages right now because people, oh, beautiful. Even, I even had somebody hit me up about Malcolm and Marie. They were like, are you willing to like look at my script and see like what are some <laughs> of the psychological implications of these characters? I was like, Hilarious. okay. Yeah. <laughs> um, I think you have a, do you have a call coming through? 
Yeah, I don't know. Okay, why. I was like, I just saw uh, it go to screen. Um, right. Okay, so I'll let you go in just a second. I have one more for you. If you could travel back in time and relive the best thing that ever happened to you, what time period in your life would you travel back to? Ooh, I would say my 13th birthday. My mom had a limousine come and pick me up and take me to school. What? And it had like balloons and a banner in it. And I just remember pulling up to school and all the kids were like, who's pulling up to like, I guess it was sixth grade, fifth grade, sixth grade in, an, in a limousine. And I just remember feeling on top of the world that day. So I would go back to that moment. Oh my gosh, yeah. I love that. That's so cute. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay, now you're going to let us all know where everybody can find you if they want to reach out to you. Um, I know you work um, specifically in uh, like the, the psychology in me that's portrayed in media. Yeah. So if anybody wants to reach out to Dr. Corey, give us your website, your social handle. Um, thank you so much for sharing today. Let us know how they can reach you. For sure. So I'm Corey Emanuel across all social media. That's Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, uh, LinkedIn. You can find me at Corey, C-O-R-E-Y, Emanuel, E-M-A-N-U-E-L. Website, same, CoreyEmanuel.com. Um, all of my posts are really at the intersection of uh, mass media, mental health, looking a lot at masculinity. So if any of what we've talked about today interests you, you'll see much more of that on my social media. Love it. Love it. And you guys can always play with my Twitter or stroke my Instagram at spicy Mari. Go to the spicy life.com, schedule a consultation. You can also click and subscribe to this episode in the spicy life podcast. Make sure that you share it with a friend and there you guys have it. You have just been spiced. The spicy